Good morning, Sojourn Church. Uh, my name is Ben McInnes. This is my wife, Becca, and uh, we've been good friends with Matt for a long time and really looking forward to leading a few songs this morning. Um, I wanted to start out by reading uh, from Psalm 34, and then, uh, then we'll start singing together. Um, so listen, listen to the word of the Lord here. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes his boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant and their faces shall never be ashamed. The poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all of his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Let's sing together. I searched the world.
How are we doing this morning? It is good to be able to gather as the people of God yet again, uh, whether you're joining us uh, socially distanced this week as we are uh, hopping back online or whether you're joining a in-person watch party at someone's house or whether you're joining us uh, in the parking lot at the Oregon Stamp Society building. Um, if you didn't get a chance, check out our blog this week. We have kind of a, an updated as we continue in phase one of uh, kind of our plan for the month of October. 
Uh, at this stage, we're just gonna announce things week by week. What we do know for sure is every single week, everything that we offer will be offered online. So that's our, our gatherings, what we're doing right now. That'll be our group that we have on Wednesday night. And then uh, we're kind of working out details right now on our midweek prayer that's gonna happen this month and even offering an online component for that so that you can join us. Uh, if you are new with us by chance, maybe you're joining us online because you saw our ad in the Concordia paper, we are so glad that you have chosen part of your weekend uh, to spend it with us here at Sojourn. My name is Matt and I'm the pastor here. And uh, we hope that you will continue to join us on weekends. Uh, this week marks several transitions for us as a church family. The first of those is this is our first gathering as Sojourn Church. Now that might sound funny, but what I mean by that is the first gathering as just Sojourn Church in the last six months. As we spent uh, six months joining uh, together with our good friends, Eastbridge Church. And last week we prayed over them and we celebrated what God has done as we were basically one church for six months and then we commissioned them and sent them back out to Southeast Portland. So continue to pray for them and, and their transition and what it is that they are going through right now. Second, and this is our first time uh, really offering something in Northeast, whether it was a, a watch party at someone's house or meeting at the Oregon Stamp Society parking lot. And uh, we have wrestled through, do we offer anything indoors? Uh, the, the weather's changing, the, the colors are starting to come out, but that also means rain is coming. And so we've really struggled through that. And that's why right now it will just be kind of a week by week announcement. But uh, we have thought through what the governor allows us, what the uh, Oregon Health Department has told us we can do. And we do wanna make it available to those who are willing and ready to gather in, in person. Um, but we will be following all the social protocols and we have a maximum number that we are allowed to have uh, if we do inside at our building, which with uh, the size of it is a 25, it's kind of spaced out, mask on at all times, hand sanitizer, uh, readily available. But all those things you'll, you'll be made well aware of as we, our goal is to over communicate during this uh, ongoing phase that we're in. And third, this is the first Sunday in October, which means that we are officially in fall. You can see a little fall decor behind me here. And this also means that we are starting a brand new series as we enter into the last quarter of the year that we are calling Kingdom Manifesto. I'm really, really excited about this series because what we're gonna be looking at is the Sermon on the Mount, which is the most influential sermon of all time. You can actually make the argument this is one of the most influential teachings in the entire history of the world. Now, you might think, if you didn't grow up in church or you're not a Christian, I'm not even familiar with this, but I guarantee that as we go throughout this sermon, you'll be very familiar with many parts of it. There are many sayings from the Sermon on the Mount that have influenced every single one of us. One of those is the phrase, treat others the way that you want to be treated. That sounds really, really good about right now as we are entering into our political season. Treat others as you want to be treated. You probably heard your mom tell you that growing up or maybe your grandmother or maybe, maybe a school teacher. And so that actually comes from right here in the Sermon on the Mount. That wasn't just something that they came up with. So it's really, really hard to overstate the importance of this sermon that we're going to be studying. Now we're gonna start by emphasizing the opening verses. Uh, this week we're just gonna look at a couple of those and then next week we're gonna look at what we call the Beatitudes. And, and it's, it's really this idea of the upside down kingdom of God and who it is that's blessed and who it is that's happy. And we're gonna camp out um, in this opening part through about the end of November. And then we're gonna take a break for our Advent season. It's hard to believe we're even planning and talking about Advent, but we'll take a break for our Advent season. And then we will pick back up in the Sermon on the Mount in January. And that'll probably take us all the way through the spring uh, season. Now, some interpreters have thought that this sermon was to describe a set of moral standards that were so high and so uh, basically impossible to achieve. And then other interpreters thought that its primary purpose was to show that, that high moral standard, but to also point to God's perfection and, to, and almost to show us our smallness as man. And, and as a result, the, that the goal was for us to rely on Christ's righteousness and realize our need for Christ. Now, where there's truth to both of those interpretations, what we see is that both of those fail to recognize that these teachings of Jesus rightly understood, they form a challenging yet practical ethic that Jesus expects, that's a key word, that he expects all of his followers to live by. That includes us in this present age. That includes us in 2020. So it wasn't just to this group that we're gonna look at over these next weeks. It was also to us, the Christ followers today. And while the Sermon on the Mount is probably the most known part of the teachings of Jesus, this is the part that everyone's very, very familiar with, it is arguably the least understood. 
And it is definitely the least obeyed. This is the nearest thing that, that as Christ followers, we find to a manifesto of Jesus' teachings. This is why we've called this series Kingdom Manifesto. And no two words probably sum up better this Sermon on the Mount than Christian counterculture. So what I want us to do is I want us to consider what does it look like to be a Christian counterculture in 2020? Now, we live in a city that is the poster child for countercultural lifestyle. We look different than many of the other cities around our nation, especially the part of the country where I'm from. And so um, shows like Portlandia have kind of heightened that and stereotyped us. And, and people look at us as maybe quirky or odd or weird and all of those things. So we're this counterculture poster child for the country. But what does it look like when a group of port people in Portland, the church, show this city that is supposedly countercultural, what it actually looks like to live a countercultural lifestyle? I think we would all agree. We found ourselves in 2020. Here we are in October. We've gone through a global pandemic. We've gone through really uh, intense and heated race conversations. We've gone through protests. We've gone through riots. We've gone through wildfires. And then individual families have gone through other things beyond that. And so I think we, at this point, we would agree that people are looking for good and right things in their lives. The people around us are looking for meaning in their lives. People are looking for peace. People are trying to find true love. People want some joy. People are looking for an all-new reality because the world that they knew pre-2020 has been flipped upside down. But here's what I would say, that people, by far and large, are looking in all of the wrong places. The first place that people should be able to turn to is the one place that's most often ignored, especially in our culture. That place is the church. And so my question for us, is why. If we, as the people of God, the church, and I'm talking about the kind of the church, not even universal, let's just say the church in America, or even localized, say the church in Portland, so that includes Sojourn and East Bridge and all the other churches that are, 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 are Christian churches. So if we, as the people of God, the church, have what people are looking for, why is the church the place that is most often ignored and the last place that most people would look? I believe it's because what people see in the church oftentimes is not countercultural. What people see most oftentimes is conformism. They don't see a new body, a, a, a new society which embodies these ideals that we'll see that Jesus teaches here. But what they see is just a different version of what they can already get elsewhere. And so when we're called to be countercultural, instead of seeing a countercultural in a different uh, set of lifestyle and ethics and ways to live, all most people see a lot of times is, is conformism. In other words, it's like the church is trying to be just like the world. I, I remember growing up as a, a, a church kid and uh, they had these Christian bookstores. They still have them and I, nothing against Christian bookstores, but I remember we go in and you could go find, you know, I was into music. So you'd, you'd go to the music section and it, could, it would actually tell you, if you like the band Metallica, you know, don't buy Metallica because they're, they're, they're not Christians and they're evil and here, you can listen to this band. This is like the Christian knockoff version. And they're not nearly as good, but you'll kind of get that same sense. And you can tell all your friends like Metallica to listen to them. Or if it was Blink-182 or just whoever your artist was. They had solo artists and bands and just, you know, all these genres. And then they even had t-shirts. I remember they'd be like popular phrases and t-shirts. And, and, and a lot of times they weren't necessarily in line with the Christian message. But you could get that same look of a t-shirt, but it would say something entirely different. So, or even something like Goodyear Tire. It might be a big tire. Instead of saying Goodyear, it would say Good News. And then they even had these little mints because, of course, the mints you get at a restaurant are not holy. So they had testaments. And it's all just a way to make money. But it was um, a poor knockoff version. And I think that's a small representation of where we found ourselves in 2020, where when the world looks at the church, they, they see a, a, a group of people who are trying to be just like them rather than being different from them. And so I have a growing concern as a pastor. I have a growing conviction that we as a church are not only see this, but with, I want us to feel the greatness of this tragedy. Much of the church today has conformed to the world. I've experienced this in Portland perhaps more than anywhere else. I've told you guys this many times, but where, where I'll see people in Portland and they'll, they, they're, they're a Christ follower, they're Christian, and they, they'll wake up in the morning and they put on their cultural lenses. They put on their Portland lenses and think, how do I uh, uh, kind of twist and adjust the, the Christian lifestyle, what the Bible teaches me into this culture rather than waking up putting on their gospel lenses and their and their christian lenses and saying how is it that i'm a called out one and do i live different in this culture while yes contextualizing and loving this culture at the same time 
And so we've found ourselves where church and non-church appear to be two versions of the same community. It's just the non-church one, or, or the church one sometimes appears to be a, a poor reflection of what the church uh, should be. But here's what I'd say. The community that we have to offer, the community as the church, as the people of God, is unique. You can't find this type of community anywhere else. You can't find it in, in Freemasons. You can't find this in, in your, your bike club or your bike tribe. You can't find this in your, your yoga class. You can't find this in the Black Lives Matter movement. You can't find this in the Greek Peace movement. You can't find this in your mommy group or your daddy group or your, your classes or your degree, whatever it is. You can't find it anywhere else because what the church has to offer if we live out the teachings of Jesus is unique. But the church as it stands in America is at a risk of contradicting its true identity. I think we found ourselves where we have lost our saltiness. You know, you put salt on something because it, it helps bring out those flavors. The church is to be a salt. We're to be salty to the world. But I think we've lost our saltiness. It tells us in Matthew 5, verse 13, which in Matthew 5 is where we're going to be this morning. But Matthew 5, 13, we'll look at in a couple weeks. And here's what it says. It says, you are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. Now, if we went around and polled our community, maybe we'll, maybe we'll do this once uh, COVID passes and social distancing isn't as strict, but if we went around and polled our community, the city of Portland, what do you think they'd say about the church? Would the people say that we are any different than them? Would, do you think people would say that, that the church has something to offer them that's unique, that they can't find anywhere else in, in our culture or society? My guess is that many of these people that we would poll would probably utter some of the most hurtful and harmful words to us as individual Christians and then us collectively as the church. I can hear echoes of people saying things such as, but you are no different from anybody else. But you are no different from anybody else. What we are offering the world, is it actually different? Are, are we not offering the world something that they can't find anywhere else? So as we study this sermon over the next several weeks, and this morning is really just kind of a, an introduction to here's kind of the setup of what we're going to be doing. You will see that there's not a single paragraph where we don't see this contrast between the Christian life and the non-Christian life. And it's, it's meant to be that way. And so we must ask ourselves, does my life look any different from my neighbors, from my coworkers, and from my friends? Must I remind us yet again that we live in what is considered the least religious, most atheistic city in our country? Sure, San Francisco is probably up there and Seattle and some of the Northeast cities, but we are definitely one of the most, if not the most. And so what that means, church, is that our lives should look very different from most of our neighbors and most of our coworkers and most of our friends, because if that stat is true, then that means we are in the minority. And so not only to be counterculture, we're the minority group in our context, in our city. And so our lives should look very different from our neighbors, our coworkers, and friends, but do they? Do our lives look any different? For those who, who call ourselves followers of Jesus, we are to be different. It says that we are to be set apart. When you set something apart, it's, you set apart for a reason. It's, it's to be different. We're to be different from both what we call the nominal church, those who just kind of are like, it's a social club and Believe me, 2020 has helped refine that down. So I think we're going to find less of that going forward. But still, we are to be different than that group. And then we're going to be different than the secular world. Our values and our ethics are to be totally different. We're, we're to be different from both the religious people and the irreligious in our culture. And so what we're going to see in the Sermon on Mount is the most complete description one can find in the entirety of the New Testament of the Christian countercultural life. So here, over these coming weeks, is where we find our Christian value system. If you ever wonder, where do, where do we get our values as Christians? Does it just sound good? Is it just moralism? No, we get it from right here. This is where we get our ethical standards. What kind of ethic do we live by? Why are we not okay with certain things? Why are, why are we not okay with certain types of injustices that we see? And why are we not okay with people losing their life? Why are we not okay with children being separated at the border? This is where we find our religious devotion. We're going to be committed to Jesus and practicing his ways, which he's going to teach us. This is where we get our attitude toward money. We looked at this a couple weeks ago in Philippians, but why it is that we want to have a generous lifestyle, that we, that we want to be people who give away crazy amounts of money for the, for the goodness of our city, but for ultimately for the glory of God. This is where we find our ambition in life. 
What is to be my supreme goal? What is the chief end of man? And this is where we should find our lifestyle and our network of relationships. All of what should be totally different and, and in a contrast to that of the non-Christian world. And this Christian countercultural lifestyle is the life of the kingdom of God. It is here that I would argue we find where we are fully human as we live out and, and live our lives under the divine rule of Jesus. And so I'd argue that you can't be fully human until you get to this place. I think it was back in Ephesians, which is well over a year ago that we looked at Ephesians, but there, there's chapter, I can't remember, it's two or three, but anyway, it talks about this idea that it basically talks about people who aren't in Christ are like the walking dead. So have you ever seen that TV show? And they're just, they're just kind of walking aimlessly with no direction, with no purpose, looking for what we as Christ followers have to offer. And so over the next several weeks, we'll find this comprehensive look at the message of Jesus and his moral vision and his ethics. So I'm gonna give you a spoiler alert on the front end. We're only gonna look at a couple of verses this week, but the spoiler alert is we're gonna actually look at the very end of the sermon so we can see where we're going. And the end of the sermon is gonna provide some fundamental clues to how it is that we are to study this sermon and how it is that we are to understand this sermon. Now, admittedly, this is the equivalent of us saying, we're gonna watch all three Lord of the Rings movies, which my family is planning on doing this winter with our children who've never watched them, but saying, we're gonna watch the last 30 minutes of the third movie so we can already see what happens, the ending, and then we're going to go back and, and watch them from the beginning so we can understand them. Now, you don't do that with movies. And if, if you do, don't tell anyone. And if you do, don't tell anyone else what happens at the ending. And so you shouldn't do it with movies, but we're going to do it with Sermon on the Mount. And so Jesus ends this sermon by calling people to, to do what he has taught. So we're going to see him teaching all throughout these three chapters. And then he's going to call on the people to actually live out and do what he taught. So Matthew chapter 7, verse 28 and 29. You don't, you don't have to turn there, but I'm going to read the very ending for us. It says, When Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. In other words, what we're going to see this sermon do, it's going to prompt us to make a decision about Jesus. Perhaps that's you this morning. Perhaps you're not a Christ follower. Perhaps you're, you're not part of the church. And you say, you know, I just showed up because I saw an ad in the Concordia paper or a friend of mine told me about it or I don't even know how I found myself here this morning, but here I am. So I haven't made a decision about Jesus. Let me just say that's okay. We are glad that you have joined us. But I'm also going to tell you this. Just like I told you the ending of the Sermon on the Mount, I'm going to tell you kind of our end goal in this. Our prayer, it's not, it's not an agenda. It, it's, it's, it's not a bait and switch, but our prayer is that by the end of this Sermon on the Mount, if you stick with us, and that's my encouragement, give us at least these eight weeks leading up to Christmas. By the end of the Sermon on the Mount, my prayer, our prayer, is that you will have a clear description of who Jesus is based on his own teachings and that you will have a clear decision to make in front of you. Either he is everything that he claims to be and, and I must follow him or he's a hoax and I'm going to continue on with my life without him. Now, over the next several weeks, we're all going to be confronted, whether you're a Christ follower right now or not a Christ follower, and Jesus is going to confront us with himself, and he's going to set before us this radical choice between obedience and disobedience. Because even as a disciple of Jesus, we have those two choices. Okay, We have, uh, uh, we have the choice. Do we, do we obey these things of Jesus? Did, did I become a Christian just to uh, get out of hell free card? Or do I actually want to live out these ways, and do I want to grow in my, my sanctification as I'm becoming more and more like Jesus? And so we have these choices put before us about these ethics and, and this moral way of living. Do I, do I obey this or do I disobey this? And, and Jesus is going to call us to an unconditional commitment of mind, will, and life to his teaching. Now, this sermon falls within the Gospel of Matthew. And so if you have your Bibles, you can go ahead and turn to the Gospel of Matthew now. We'll, we'll be in uh, chapter 5 this morning. And while I eventually hope to work our entire way through this Gospel, we're jumping in five chapters in, so there's a little bit of backstory here. Now, if you are been in church for a number of uh, years, then you'll understand this. But to catch us up to speed at this point, where we're entering in, Jesus has already been baptized. He's already gone out to the wilderness and been tempted. He's now returned to Galilee, and he has called four disciples to follow him. And then we're going to jump in here at chapter 5. So let me pray with us this morning, or pray for us rather, and then we'll uh, get started in the text itself. God, we come to you this morning and we thank you for this opportunity to gather as your church. God, it has been a wild ride of a year, but we thank you that 
uh, we still have opportunities, whether it's online or in parking lots or parks. God, being just reminded that the church is not a building. The church is a people. And God, that we have continued to be faithful in gathering together, even throughout this year. God asks, as we look at the Sermon on the Mount, that it would radically change our lives, regardless of how long we've followed you or how long we've been in church. And God, we pray for those who haven't made a decision about you, that they would have a clear decision to make, whether it's this morning or in eight weeks or in the spring. But God, that they would have a clear decision in front of them to make about who you are, based on who you said you are and based on your teachings. In your name, Jesus. Amen. All right. So we already looked at the end of this sermon. I've already kind of given you the spoiler alert. But to frame the context of the sermon, which, which once again, we're only getting into the beginning couple verses here, but I want us to actually look at a few verses in chapter four. So if you've already turned to chapter five, you might need to turn back a page or just kind of look up a page or just scroll up a little bit if you're on your phone on your Bible app. I'm gonna start at verse um, chapter four, verse 23, and I'll work my way through, verse, uh, through chapter five, verse one. Chapter four, verse 23. It says, and he went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. So his fame spread throughout all Syria, and they brought him all the sick, those afflicted with various diseases and pains, those oppressed by demons, those having seizures and paralytics, and he healed them. And great crowds followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis and from Jerusalem and Judea and from beyond the Jordan. And then verse 1, chapter 5. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. Now, what's essential for us to understand fully the Sermon on the Mount is to actually understand the Old Testament history of Israel. And so we find this sermon is towards the beginning of Jesus' public ministry. It is here immediately following his baptism and his temptation that he begins announcing the good news of the kingdom. And the thing had long been promised throughout the entire Old Testament. So if you know much about the Old Testament or if you studied it, you know that there's these prophecies that come out. And they're saying, there is one coming, there is one coming, there is one coming, and that the kingdom of God will come, the kingdom of God. And, they've been, and they're waiting year after year, but we're seeing generation after generation who, who are no longer exist. And I can see the people just going like, is this, is this ever going to happen? And, and, and so they're, they're waiting for this. And so here we are, we found ourselves, we're now on the threshold of its arrival. And so it's, now it's coming. And who comes to inaugurate it? Jesus himself. He comes into the history of humankind, and here's the rule of God as it breaks into the world. And Jesus is going around, and here's his message. Jesus would go out and he would cry out, and he would say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, we don't necessarily do it that way now, but maybe we should. Maybe we should walk around uh, Alberta Street and and Alberta Park and Fernhill Park. Maybe we should go around and say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. I feel like 2020 is the one year that's made me kind of, what is it? Maybe that's my evangelism strategy, just to, just to do exactly what Jesus did. But we, we see that this is how he went about teaching. And we saw in verse 23, it says he went about all of Galilee. He was teaching in their synagogues. And what would he do when he got there? He would proclaim the gospel of the kingdom. And so Jesus was coming and he was giving a different message. He was giving the message that, the people in the synagogue, they were waiting for. They've been hearing about this. And he's like, no, look, look, it's here. It's coming. You need to repent now for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And I'm proclaiming to you the gospel of the kingdom. And so it's now in this context that we, that we work through the framework that we must view the Sermon on the Mount. Because in it, this is where we find repentance and righteousness that belong in the kingdom. This, this sermon is going to describe for us what human life and community look like when they come under the gracious rule and reign of God. Think about your life prior to coming to Christ. Think about a, maybe a group of people who's not a church who, who, who doesn't put their life under the rule and reign of Christ. This is where we're going to see that difference. So we're going to see what it looks like once we align our lives with that of Jesus. Now, at this point in chapter 5, Jesus stands at the height of his popularity. Okay? He had been kind of on the speaking circuit as he went through all throughout all of Galilee. Fox News had him and CNN had him and MSNBC and, and Oprah had him and Ellen had him. Everyone had him because Jesus was popular at this point. Okay, like he's in the bestsellers list. And it's like, man, I want to go and hear this guy speak. And so we see that he would gather crowds because even if they weren't followers, they're very interested because they've seen him on all these TV shows. Like, I want to go see what this hype is all about. And so we have all these crowds that are gathering. And by the end of this sermon, in chapter 7, the crowds are even larger. And so that we see his ministry, it touched the masses. He impacted huge amounts of people. But then we also see that he saw a need specifically to get away with his close followers. 
that we saw in verse 1, where it says he, he, went, he went to get away, which, by the way, the Sermon on the Mount was never called the Sermon on the Mount by Jesus. It's because he went up on a mount or went up on a hill. And so that's where we call it the Sermon on the Mount. He went up there and then he delivered a sermon. And so we see the masses, although he's going away and he's, he's going to kind of focus in on his, his close followers, his disciples, we also see the crowds continue to follow him as well. And so we see that in that context, we, we come to understand that as Jesus was trying to, to get away from the crowds, or as it appears, and the, the people are still there, that Jesus, is in his opening verses, he's presented as the new Moses. As you look at the Old Testament history, Jesus is presented as the new Moses, but not by replacing Moses. I think some people have taught, like, Jesus came to replace Moses. No, he didn't come to replace Moses, but he came to fulfill Moses. In other words, he came to fulfill what Moses was teaching, what Moses was pointing to. And so we see Jesus comes, he's teaching the new law as the new Moses for the new people of God. So the gospel then is the completion of Israel's story and the story of Jesus. Let me say that again. The gospel is the completion of Israel's story. Once again, we're kind of referencing the Old Testament in the story of Jesus. And so from the very get-go of the Sermon on the Mount, we are ushered into this new gospel reality. Here's what the nation of Israel had waited for for all these years. And here's the fulfillment of this gospel reality where we see that Israel's Torah and their moral vision has now come under the completion in Jesus' moral vision. Scott McKnight, a New Testament scholar and professor at a seminary in uh, Illinois says, the Sermon on the Mount is a compelling presentation of Jesus and his moral vision. Pushed to the next level, what this means is that reading or teaching or preaching the Sermon on the Mount is evangelism. And so that's what our hope is during these next several weeks. Now, yes, evangelism is part of that, is opening your mouth. And, and yes, we like to show our love, but I've told you this before, we're not going to outshow love and out-volunteer out the city of Portland. So if someone we have to open our mouth and, and tell people what it is we actually believe, but I also think in a really real way that as we, as we teach through this Sermon on the Mount from Jesus himself and using Jesus' words, that it, part of it is evangelism. And that is part of our evangelist strategy, that, that the word of God is powerful and it's true and that it will not return void. I think about just a few weeks ago, I preached a sermon that I didn't feel like it was, it was great necessarily. It wasn't a knock it out of the park, but I delivered it. And I got a text from one of you, super encouraging, just how encouraged you were and how it had impacted your life. And a reminder for me was, it's not about you, Matt. It's about the Word of God, and the word, word of God does not return void. And so that is our prayer throughout these next weeks as we look at this. That this is part of our evangelism strategy. Now look at verse 2. It's the last verse that we'll look at this morning. It says, And he opened his mouth, and he taught them. And so we see Jesus, back in verse 1, he sit, he's seated after he gets up on the hill, which is the common way that a rabbi of the day would teach. And so whereas most preachers today, it seems like they stand up. Can you see someone sit? I'm standing right now. But you would see a rabbi sit. And so Jesus sat and he opened his mouth and he taught them. Now, refers to his disciples, which uh, also the, the Greek word there is implying a learner. So a disciple is a learner. Those who had, who had committed their life to Jesus and were following him as their Messiah. And they had also committed to practicing his ways of living. And we also see the crowds. Those, those who were curious, those who were often amazed by Jesus' teachings, once again, those masses who were like, man, I'm gonna, I want to go hear him on the, on the circuit, on the, on, the, on the preaching tour. But they remained much like the city of Portland. One of, one of, one of the things in Portland is we see this kind of spirit and attitude of apathy. And so the people here, the masses, were kind of impartial and uncommitted. They knew about Jesus. They knew, knew about the teaching of Jesus, and they were very interested and curious, but they were just remained impartial. Like, you do you, I'll do me. That's good for you. And, and I see that a lot in the city of Portland, where, uh, you know, being the least religious and most atheistic city, I kind of thought, man, is everyone going to be like totally anti just me? I've got a lot of friends here who, who don't know Jesus, who don't want anything to do with Jesus. And that's okay. And, and so they, they accept me for who I am, and they think that's great, but they just kind of remain apathetic. Like, that's great that you have found uh, something in Jesus that you can rely on, but that's just not for me. And so the masses here kind of represent that crowd that we have in the city of Portland as well. And so my question is, which one are you? Are you a committed to follower of Jesus? Are you a, a disciple that modern day, some people call that an apprentice? Are you saying, man, I'm one who wants to follow Jesus as my Savior and Lord and also want to learn the ways of Jesus and become more like him? Or are you still in the crowd? Are you still kind of peering in from afar and just saying, I'm not so sure about this. Sure, it seems like a good guy, seems like a great religious teacher, but I'm just not so sure. Maybe you've kind of put Jesus in the camp with someone like Gandhi and said, eh, there's Gandhi, there's Jesus. You kind of pick which one you prefer. But if Jesus in actuality 
is the new Moses, if he's the, if he's the law-giving teacher for the new people of God, then there is one proper response. And that proper response is for us to assume the posture of a student, for us to assume the posture of a disciple, for us to assume the posture of an apprentice as we want to practice the ways of Jesus. Tim Keller says that if Jesus rose from the dead, then you have to accept all that he said. If he didn't rise from the dead, then why worry about any of it? And so, obviously, we're studying this Sermon on the Mount, but we know the entire story. We know that, that Jesus was born of a virgin, and he came and lived a perfect life that none of us could live. He died a death on a cross, and he was crushed for our sin and for our iniquities, and he rose again to new life so that we could be restored to being fully human, to how it is that we were designed to be. And so knowing that, if Jesus actually rose from the dead, which, you know, which once we get to Easter, typically when we look at that, then we have to accept all that he says. That means we have to accept all that he said in the Sermon on the Mount and posture ourselves as followers and as students. And so over the next eight weeks, we are going to encounter Jesus in this simple reading of this gospel lesson in the Gospel of Matthew. And I encourage you to do so, regardless where you're coming at this with, that I encourage you to do so as a student and posture yourself as sitting at the feet of Jesus and allowing Jesus to teach us over these coming weeks. Now, an obvious question you might be asking yourself. You might be thinking, is this sermon even relevant to us? Not the one that I'm delivering, but is the Sermon on the Mount relevant to us today? I mean, things have changed a whole, whole lot since this time. And so I think in the coming weeks, one of the striking things that stands out to me is you're gonna find this coherent whole in the sermon. And this sermon does depict the behaviors that Jesus expects of his followers then and now. This is the way that we are to live. This is where we're going to find that countercultural lifestyle in a different way of living all together. So yes, this sermon is relevant to the people of God then and to the people of God now, his disciples who are also citizens of God's kingdom. So I think about even in our election year, do you find your ultimate citizenship in, in America and your country where you are or ultimately in the kingdom of heaven? And so what then is the proper response to the Sermon on the Mount? What, what is, I've already told you kind of the posture, what's the proper response to the Sermon on the Mount? The proper response is to follow and obey its teachings because we are called to do what Jesus teaches. Once again, think about that Tim Keller quote. If he actually rose from the dead, then we have to follow and do everything he said. And so we are called to do what Jesus teaches. And this obedience leads to an entirely new way of living, what it is, that countercultural lifestyle. And so as we finish up this morning, here's what I want to do. I want to pray to that end. I want to pray that we would see ourselves as apprentices of Jesus. I want to pray that we would see ourselves as sitting at his feet and learning as we further come into the citizenship of members of his kingdom. And so may we collectively cry out to the Lord this morning as his people, as his church. Here's the few of the, the, the cries that I want us to have. I want us to cry out and say, Lord, save us from being caught up in our own pursuits so that we are not good neighbors to those where you have placed us. Lord, we praise you for your radical forgiveness when we found ourselves enslaved and enchained in our own pursuits and sinfulness. Lord, deliver us from the self-crippling effects of our own fears and self-pity and anger and self-consciousness and discouragement. Lord, teach us to depend on you at all times, especially when we're caught by the storms of life when we weren't expecting them like in 2020. And Lord, we praise you for your steadfast love, for your unwavering kindness to us by your work on the cross, and that by it you allow us to come to you with our needs and you hear us. And so go ahead wherever you are this morning. If you're at a watch party with some others, if you're at home in your bedroom, wherever you are, unless you're driving, wherever you are, go ahead and close your eyes with me this morning. And what I want us to do is I just want us to sit for a few moments in the silence as we listen to the voice of God and how it is that he would want us to posture ourselves and respond in these coming weeks. God, I ask as we listen that we could hear you speak to us specifically and individually through your spirit. God, I ask that you would speak to us as your church. God, a church that's been 
affected just like every other church by this pandemic and by just 2020 and the storms of life. But God, that we would trust in you and rely on you, that you are still building your church. God, we trust that there is a plentiful harvest around us in the city of Portland. God, the, the problem is not in the harvest. The problem is as we continue to worship this morning, we have a few ways to respond. Ben's going to come back up and lead us in a song of praise and that, sing those words. Allow those words to wash over you, but also sing those praise out to Jesus. We also have an opportunity to give. Uh, we like to say at Sojourn, we give of our time, our talent, our treasure. And so uh, whatever it looks like for you to be generous as an act of worship. And then the final way is prayer. Uh, prayer is available. And so if you look in the chat bar, you can say, I need prayer, or there's a, I think there's actually a request prayer button on there, or if you're at a watch party, uh, socially distance, ask someone else to, to pray for you. And so prayer is available. Um, you can also join us on Wednesdays at noon where we're going to start doing midweek prayer during this month, and we'll, we'll communicate more details on that uh, probably tomorrow morning. And so sojourn, the time is yours. Respond accordingly. Prayer is available. Love you, church. Mm-hmm.